Okay, so as we began our study, we started, we started our study with, okay, from God's Word. What is God's Word? Where did it come from? And we learned very quickly that God is the author of our Bibles, isn't it? And so God is the author. It's credible and it's authoritative. And so we bow before the living Word of God. That is our beginning point. That is our authority. And we use this picture of the prophets to kind of remind us of that particular truth, right? And then we started in, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we began looking at who God is as eternal and kind of this black, uh, blue backdrop here because he's before time, eternal, all-powerful, self-existent, supreme spirit, ever-present, one yet trinity, all-knowing, holy, perfect, owner and ruler, just looking at the characteristics of God from, from his word, right? His word reveals who he is. And the very first thing that God created was the angels, right? Before he created anything else, he created the spirits, perfect, because he is perfect, because he is holy. And so we looked at our, our timeline here. We put up angels up here in our timeline so that, that they were the first things that God created as his servants and his messengers um, to serve him and to worship him. And so as we've been going along, we've been kind of creating this chart here just to make sure that we know who God is, right? And we're kind of doing some comparing. God is eternal without beginning or end. We as humanity... We have a beginning, didn't we? How about the spirits? How about the angels? Do they have a beginning? Yes, they're not eternal. God is all-powerful and self-existent. He needs nothing. What do we need? We need God, don't we? What do the spirits need? They need God as well, right? So God is supreme spirit. We have a body and we are limited. The spirits, they are spirit, but they're unlike God. Um, God is everywhere present at all times. We as mankind? One place, one time, right? Right? How about the spirits? One place, one time. And again, God is one yet trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, uh, uh, three persons in one being. We are one person and one being, and the spirits, they're one spirit, and uh, they're one person, one being as well, not like God. God is all-knowing. We were limited and blind in comparison. So are the spirits, right? God is absolutely holy and always acts perfectly. We as mankind... We're not like God, are we? Can't, we don't create perfectly. And the angels, the spirits, they too are unlike God. And so God is absolute owner and perfect ruler over all his creator. And who do we exist for? God and God alone. He created us. He, he, we are his own, we, uh, he owns us. And the spirits, they exist for God as well. So who is greater? Who is greater? God is, isn't he? He is so much greater. Okay, so yeah, last night we looked at this particular truth that um, God's creation of the spirits reveals his unlimited power and knowledge, reveals his holiness and perfection, and reveals his absolute ownership and perfect rule. What truth did you guys take with you from that lesson? Any additional thoughts from, as you're kind of thinking at all, anything kind of an aha moment for you that maybe you hadn't considered previously? Yeah. Do you, feel, do you feel like a little bit of humbling happening in your spirit, in your whole, in your heart? Just a, a kind of a lowering back to, oh, yes, yeah, that's where I belong. Is that you finding that's taking place in your heart? Anything else? Stand out questions or comments from that? Again, not new truths. Some of you have been believers longer than I've been alive. But, but again, we're just kind of revisiting those truths, right? Going back to the basics. Yeah, yeah, right, yes. We're, we're kind of a product of our culture, aren't we? Our whole culture says it's all about us. You deserve a break today. All of our advertising props us up. It, it lifts us up. It's my decision. It's what I want to do. It's what I want to drive. It keeps, it keeps elevating us, right? And what do, we need by, what do we need God by his spirit to do? Bring us back down to our place, and absolutely. And you know what? As we taught this particular truth amongst the Mangan, we actually had to, had to come up with a different name for God because their traditional name for God was so corrupted. 
And so the term that we actually used was the creator. And the one who creates is absolute owner. They were shocked. Every time they would hear that term for God, it resonated this particular truth of his absolute ownership and his rule. And his word then was also not to be questioned, not to be trifled or, or changed. And uh, very, very powerful truths. So today's lesson is going to reveal more of who God is and His majesty and His glory. See, as we go to His Word, we're not interested in in all of the extra, all the other stuff. We want to see God. It's it's about Him. It's about His name. It's about His glory. So take your Bibles and let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. Give it a second for everyone to find it because we want to hear from him, right? We want to hear from the living word of God. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 6. Can I wait for this Mr. Enns to find it there? So he's got it? Sticky fingers, fingers, yes. Too many many Rice Krispies at dessert time for supper tonight, yes. Oh, okay. (laughs) Verse 6, that's what it says. No one is like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is mighty in power. So what is the one true God like? What is the one true God like? Powerful, Powerful, absolutely, yes. He is unlike any of us. He is unlike any of us, right? Nothing he can be compared with. And so in in some ways, we're kind of wrong in doing this, right? Like we're kind of comparing ourselves to him, but it's almost wrong. It's almost not right to do that. But again, somehow trying to get our minds wrapped around that he is so different and so, maybe a good word is he is so other, so completely other. And uh, we were created in his image. We're going to see as we go along in our lessons. Okay, so here's where we're going to go this evening. So God reveals himself in creation. So we see his orderliness. We see his faithfulness. His creation is going to reveal his purposefulness as we look at his, his word this evening. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 1. Amazingly enough, there is so much there to learn, so much there to glean from. We are going to continue, to, well, at least tonight anyways, we are going to continue to take a look at Genesis chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 to 5. Genesis chapter 1 to 5. And uh, in this uh, first part that we're going to look at, we will see God, how he reveals himself in creation as being orderly. Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, or 1 to 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that light was good. He separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. So what was the first thing that we see here in Genesis God created? Light. Did he say anything about the sun, moon, and stars? Do we notice that? He, just say, he says nothing about the sun, moon, and stars. We noticed that, didn't we? So do, does anybody have a question about that? Don't be asking me about it, by the way. But does anybody question that? <laughs> so he said, let there be light. There's two, kinds of light. There's two kinds of light. Do we have a learned young man here that can tell us what the two kinds of light are? <laughs> One light was himself. One light was himself and his glory. One light was his glory. And then the next light that we'll see in another day or two, in the book anyways, in the Bible. So God creates the light before before anything else is created. Now you and I, to work our, wrap our heads around this, the only way we're able to create light is with a flick of a bick or a plug in a light, turn the switch on, anything else like that, right? That's the only way that we can create a light. But this is God, God Almighty all-powerful. He simply speaks and light exists. Incredible, isn't it? 
So let's read the second day of creation to see more of his orderliness. Let's read verses 6 to 8 of Genesis chapter 1. Who wants to read verses 6 to 8 for me, please? Go ahead, Chad. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, for the evening and the morning were the second day. Okay, so what did God create on the second day? Yeah, the firmament, the atmosphere, right? He's separating the water from the water. And so as a result of that, kind of created that above. And so how does that water stay in the sky? All of those years, how has it stayed up there? By his power, right? See, this is reflecting God as a God of order and how he designs and, and how, he, how he puts things together and how long he's done it. So what did he create on the third day? Let's take a look at what he created in verse 9. Verse 9 and 10, And God said, Let the water under the, dry, under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called dry ground land, and he gathered waters he called the seas. And God saw that it was good. We can see fairly clearly that he created dry land and seas. Now let's take a look at what they did on the second half of the day. Genesis 1, 11 to 13. And God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing, uh, plants bearing seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. What did he create? On that one day, he created what? Land, land and seas, yep, and? and? And vegetation, yes, all that aspects of the ground. So if you're picturing this, and I don't know if you've ever done this before, but if you're sitting there um, and you're thinking about what that would have looked like, the first day, he creates light, and then he creates a vast expanse and then on the third day, he creates, uh, he's got the land that he creates. And no sooner does he create the land, of course, what he's doing is just he's uh, moving the water aside. Um, no sooner does he create land that he creates vegetation. Boom. Boom. We are talking color. Boom. We are talking trees from the smallest blade of grass to the largest tall oak tree, trees and flowers, the colors must have been incredible. So something to, something to consider, the possibility is incredible. Because we're talking about an almighty God, is, are we not? And not just seeds, but we're talking, or not just plants, but the reference here is seed bearing plants. So these are full-grown fruit is what I would read this as, right? This is not just seedlings. We are talking trees, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking fruit-bearing trees and the such forth. Incredible, incredible to think of. Just mind-boggling. So how thankful are you for a God of order? taking the blackness and then bringing all of that, bringing chaos and bringing it into order. Every part of creation so far has revealed who God is, right? It's all a reflection of him. So consider this for a second. So God created the source of light before anything that needed it. You see how he's orderly? He's building these purposes in. God created the atmosphere before anything that needed air to breathe. He's pre putting everything into order. God created the dry land before anything that needed that land. And then on that land, God created boundaries for the seas before anything that needed it. And then the plants that went on there going forward. So why would God build such order into his creation? He didn't need any of it, right? Why, why all of these, like why all of the system here? Like, again, is it, like what's he doing here? Why is he doing it? Because that's who he is. Yes. That's exactly who he is. And one more step, it's who he is, but then what is the result? What, what's the result for us? Making ready for people. 
Yes, making you ready for people, absolutely. And then we stand back as well and we do what? We say, God, you are incredible. Like, like think of the immenseness. Think of his glory and his majesty as he's reflecting and revealing what? His orderliness. We get to see who he is. See, he could have created everything in an instant, couldn't he? he could, in one minute, he could have created it all. But see how he's doing it step by step? He didn't need to do that. He's doing that so that we would see him and we would glorify him. Think of God's order from another, <coughs> another angle. So when we plant a garden, how do we follow God's principles of order? When we plant a garden, how do we follow God's step-by-step -step approach when you plant a garden? Do you just kind of walk into the bush and start throwing some seeds out? No, what do we need to do first? Prep. You got to prepare the soil, right? You got to prepare the soil, and then the seed, and then there's got to some rain, and you got to put some moisture into it, and then the sun, and things continue to grow. To this very day, the order that God instilled from the very beginning, his character, is how we, how we live, right? Absolutely. So you're thinking about plants. I know... <coughs> Um, I have an acreage. I love shrubs, trees, and my wife takes care of the flowers. But I love the shrubs and I love the trees. And I know for sure that you folk here know plants. You know plants. Trees, shrubs, grain even, crop. You know that everything that you've seen and heard has a beginning found somewhere here on these days. So just to wrap our head around, how many, how many species of plants and trees and flowers, an assortment of stuff that God created, I'd like for you to just shout it or say it in as many as you can, and I'll give you one, two, three, go. Does that make sense? So just wrap your head around how many you're going to say, and I want you to say it all at as many times as you can, and we're going to say it all at once. You ready? Does it make sense? However many trees or shrubs or species you can come up with, just kind of say it out loud so we can hear it. I'll give you a count of one, two, three. Sound like a plan? One, two, three. Tell That's what I was going to do. Pine pineapple, sour pineapple. sap, mangoes, oaks, spruce. Evergreen. Oh my goodness, you're going to go on and on and on. Exactly. So do you get the idea here? A myriad of different kinds, all in a moment's notice. A myriad of different kinds shows up in a moment. Crazy. One minute the, 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 the land is dry, and the next minute some 300,000 plus species of trees and plants instantly come into being. Can you imagine what that must have looked like? So let's put, so think about this, about the God of order. Whoever's tried to put a cabinet together from Ikea without following the instructions? Anybody ever tried that? How does it go? Does it go real good? No, it doesn't. Well, there's a sequence to it, right? So imagine, think about our universe. If God didn't build order into our universe, what would it be like? Imagine if the light came on and off at random. Imagine if the gravity turned on and off at random. You never knew from one minute to the next, am I going up or am I coming down? What would life be like? <laughs> See, it would be crazy, right? See, our very existence depends upon this God of order. He's built it into everything around us. And he's even built into it the laws that govern everything that we do. See, these laws are fixed, constant, and they govern everything about this universe. Without them, we would, not we would not exist. This reveals God's order in the beginning and down through the years. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. What I want to do is I want to show you a short video clip. Hopefully my speaker is going to work. Of just to reflect of, of the God of order. And this is how does science argue for or against God. Let's see if this works. In 1966, Time magazine ran a cover story asking, Is God Dead? The cover reflected the fact that many people had accepted the cultural narrative that God is obsolete, that as science progresses, there's less need for a God to explain the universe. 
It turns out, though, that the rumors of God's death were premature. In fact, perhaps the best arguments for his existence come from, of all places, science itself. Here's the story. The same year Time featured its now famous headline, the astronomer Carl Sagan announced that there were two necessary criteria for a planet to support life, the right kind of star and a planet the right distance from that star. Given the roughly octillion planets in the universe, that's one followed by 24 zeros, there should have been about septillion planets, that's one followed by 21 zeros, capable of supporting life. With such spectacular odds, scientists were optimistic that the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, known by its initials SETI, an ambitious project launched in the 1960s, was sure to turn up something soon. With a vast radio telescopic network, scientists listened for signals that resembled coded intelligence. But as the years passed, the silence from the universe was deafening. As of 2014, researchers have discovered precisely bubkis, not a zilch, which is to say zero followed by an infinite number of zeros. What happened? As our knowledge of the universe increased, it became clear that there were, in fact, far more factors necessary for life, let alone intelligent life, than Sagan supposed. His two parameters grew to 10, then 20, and then 50, which meant that the number of potentially life-supporting planets decreased accordingly. The number dropped to a few thousand planets and kept on plummeting. Even SETI proponents acknowledged the problem. Peter Schenkel wrote in a 2006 piece for Skeptical Inquirer, a magazine that strongly affirms atheism, in light of new findings and insights, we should quietly admit that the early estimates may no longer be tenable. Today, there are more than 200 known parameters necessary for a planet to support life, every single one of which must be perfectly met or the whole thing falls apart. For example, without a massive, gravity-rich planet like Jupiter nearby to draw away asteroids, Earth would be more like an interstellar dartboard than the verdant orb that it is. Simply put, the odds against life in the universe are astonishing. Yet, here we are, not only existing, but talking about existing. What can account for it? Can every one of those many parameters have been perfectly met by accident? At what point is it fair to admit that it is science itself that suggests that we cannot be the result of random forces? Doesn't assuming that an intelligence created these perfect conditions in fact require far less faith than believing that a life-sustaining Earth just happened to beat the inconceivable odds? But wait, there's more. The fine-tuning necessary for life to exist on a planet is nothing compared with the fine-tuning required for the universe to exist at all. For example, astrophysicists now know that the values of the four fundamental forces, gravity, the electromagnetic force, and the strong and weak nuclear forces, were determined less than one millionth of a second after the Big Bang. Alter any one of these four values ever so slightly, and the universe as we know it could not exist. For instance, if the ratio between the strong nuclear force and the electromagnetic force had been off by the tiniest fraction of the tiniest inconceivable fraction, then no stars could have formed at all. Multiply that single parameter by all the other necessary conditions, and the odds against the universe existing are so heart-stoppingly astronomical that the notion that it all just happened defies common sense. It would be like tossing a coin and having it come up heads ten quintillion times in a row. I don't think so. Fred Hoyle, the astronomer who coined the term Big Bang, said that his atheism was greatly shaken by these developments. One of the world's most renowned theoretical physicists, Paul Davies, has said that the appearance of design is overwhelming. Even the late Christopher Hitchens, one of atheism's most aggressive proponents, conceded that without question the fine-tuning argument was the most powerful argument of the other side. Oxford University professor of mathematics, Dr. John Lennox, has said, the more we get to know about our universe, the more the hypothesis that there is a creator gains in credibility as the best explanation of why we are here. 
The greatest miracle of all time is the universe. It is the miracle of all miracles, one that inescapably points to something or someone beyond itself. I'm Eric Metaxas for Prager University. God reveals himself, excuse me, God reveals himself as a God of order, and we see that all the way through creation, and scientists are, are responding to that order, seeing design. So our next step is to look, take a look at a passage, Genesis 1 again. Genesis 1, we're going to read verses 14 to 18, and we are going to look at God as he reveals himself in creation as being faithful. Genesis 1, verses 14 and 18. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light in the earth, on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, a greater light to govern the day, and a lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. And God said, Let the expanse of the Sky to get, uh, and God set them in the expanse of the sky to give them to give light on the earth to govern the day and the night and to separate light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. God definitely saw that it was good. This is on the fourth day of creation. God spoke the sun and the moon and the stars and all the planets into existence on the fourth day. For what purpose? order for each day? To give us each day to make sure each day was laid out, right? Anyone else? Mm -hmm. For seasons? For seasons, giving us the seasons that we have growing and other and or otherwise seasons. What determined before this light was there? Day <coughs> and night. There was another light <laughs> You're thinking way too deep for us right now. Way too deep for us right now. God obviously, God obviously led it, didn't he? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He created a light. I believe it was his glory that he let shine. Uh, but he definitely created the light. And then he gave us the sun. We have only seen the sun as that source of light. And that's what determined day and night to come. Mm -hmm. The sun is what determined. But see, at, here it says that the sun, the greater lights were ruling the day. Yeah. Not, not, didn't, um, there already was light before that. So there was already light before that. The sun was there to rule the day. To rule the day, suggesting, yeah. suggesting that he was simply darkness. there. What? Darkness. Darkness, yeah. <laughs> Keep it from darkness. Let's move on, though. <laughs> But it also, say, it also says in Colossians 1.17 that, that by him he holds all things together. And so again, he's the director, right? Not the son, he's the director behind it all. So we see his faithfulness and that is the moon still rotates around the earth. The, the earth still rotates around the sun. And as we saw in the video, there's a planet there that actually takes a beating for us here on earth. Constantly, all the time, all year round. Life here on Earth, we already know, would not exist unless any part of those, any parameter of those uh, laws did not exist or even were a bit changed. Is our God not faithful to keep those rules and regulations and those laws in place for us that we might continue to live? And for his ultimate what? Glory. All of these rules and regulations are in place for his ultimate and to show us his ultimate glory. So just think about it. God speaks. This is, do you know what planet this is? Sun. This is the sun? Okay, yes. So this is the sun, and in comparison to the sun, here is earth. And I, I, I uh, was hoping to be able to show you some other pictures of some of the other planets and 
there are astronomically massive, way bigger. Like, um, if we showed you a picture of Canis Morris, okay, keep on going with your thing. Anyways, amazingly huge. <laughs> one million Earths, the sun is so much bigger that one million Earths will fit into the sun. The sun is so much bigger, and yep. God spoke it into being. So let's read uh, chapter 1, verses 20 and 25. Let's take a quick look at it. 20 to 25. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And we're going to read right through to 25. And God said, <coughs> Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. What did God create on the fifth and the sixth day? That's a mouthful. We're talking about a huge variety of fish, large and small. Makes reference to a large fish, doesn't it? Anything else? The birds, right? Mm -hmm. The insects. Domestic and wild animals. Mm -hmm. Domestic and wild animals, yep. Everything from the dinosaur to the tiny ant, believe it or not. He maintained this animal, uh, this cycle of animals all these years. In other words, the animal kind only create the animal kind. You cannot get anything else out of those animals. You can't get something else out of a bird. A bird is a bird is a bird is a bird. A dog is a dog. You can get different kinds of dogs, but it's still a dog. And a cat is still a cat. And God has maintained that, faithfully maintaining that a cat, once born, remains a cat. And when that cat has another cat, you're guaranteed it's going to be another cat. So we believe that God is faithful. We see that God is faithful in his creation and such. And what's amazing, though, is at the end of that passage, what did God say? It was good. What's God's version of good? Perfect. God's version of good is perfect. It's not good enough. No, it's not good enough. And see, the, the incredible thing is that God is faithful to his standard, right? So God's in his perfection. He is faithful in everything that he created every down to every species. Now, what beauty must suddenly have appeared out on the earth there? What kind of, what do you think it sounded like? Is all of these birds, these different birds, all of a sudden began to sing out and all the different animals. What do you think it sounded like? What do you think it looked like? Can you imagine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God said it and bang, it was there, right? Yes. Yeah. And what did the angels do as they saw all of that take place? They sang for joy, right? No wonder, because they're seeing God in his faithfulness as he began to create every part of it. A huge, huge. And we see in, in, um, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 30, for the sake of time, we won't go there, but all of the animals, they ate vegetation in the beginning. You know, there was no dog-eat-dog. -dog. There was no wild animals, as it were, in that sense of fear of man or, or fear of each other. Everything was created perfect. God was faithful in all that he did. So God displays his faithfulness in other ways as well. He built consistency in all of creation and how plants and animals reproduce. They always reproduce after their own kind, as mentioned. God built consistency in the days, the nights, the seasons, and the years. They can calculate. Scientists today can go back centuries to determine the exact positions of the sun, the moon, and the stars. They do not. The title charts for the whole world are written in years in advance. Why? Because God is faithful to keep that bus moving. <laughs> and rockets can land on moving planets that are millions of miles away only because God has put it in place and he's created this beautiful machine that keeps that machine moving, if I could call 
Yeah. Is yeah. I think so. But he continues to keep it just ticking perfectly, right? All of the, all of these all of these generations. See, our very existence depends upon a God who is faithful. Right? Like our very existence depends upon a God who is faithful. Colossians 1:17 states, "He is before all things, and in him all things hold together." Like why are we even here today, guys? Because we have a God who's faithful, right, to all of those things. So look at this picture. Go back to this picture of the sun. Do we realize that this sun is 15 million degrees Celsius? And who holds that sun in its perfect or, uh, rotation? So consider that. Who holds that in its perfect rotation so that we're here and not there? Imagine if we were just a little closer to the sun. What would happen to us here? Yeah, yeah, we would be fried, right? And if we were a little bit further away, it wouldn't be just minus 50, right? Who holds all of these planets in rotation? God does. How many years has he been doing that? That many years he has been doing that since the beginning of time. Day in, day out, right? Yes. <laughs> But see, that's who God is. That's who he is faithful. Year after year after year, each matchstick a year, there's some 10,000 matches there. God has been doing this faithfully year in and year out, right? How thankful are you for a God who is faithful? Amen? I'm going to read verses 6 to 9, Psalm chapter 33. Are we there yet? Psalm chapter 33, verses 6 to 9. Somewhere in the middle of your Bible. Everybody's got it? Verses 6 to 9. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars, and he puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. God was purposeful, meaning he was intentional, determined on a course of action. He's doing something with complete purpose. His purposefulness is evident in both how he created everything and why he created everything. And here we see in this passage that when he spoke, it happened. What other words describe what happened in this passage? Sorry. Is he messing with me? <laughs> Cheat sheets. I'm, I'm for you guys. Okay? I'm helping here, right? What other words did he use to describe what's happening here in this passage? He spoke, I gave you that one, his word, his breath. He simply spoke and everything came to be. I see the imagery when he says he gathered the waters of the seas. The first thing I picture is, is, is me gathering all my laundry off the bed and throwing them in the uh, laundry basket. But he didn't even use his arm. He simply spoke. He put the deep into the storehouses, didn't he? He commanded and it stood firm, immovable. To what end has all this been created? For his? For his glory. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. Let all the people of the earth glorify him. Definitely. Imagine. He simply spoke, and the galaxies and the moons and the stars came to life. Truly, he is beyond understanding. There is no God like this one true God. So let's go a little bit. Let's go a little bit further. Okay, so we see this already. So then, let all. What's, what's his desire in creating everything? Why did he create everything in this process over over six days? 
so that we would see him and we would revere him. So flip over to Psalms 19 and, and notice what it says in Psalms 19. Again, why did he create this? What is his purpose? Because again, why he's doing things. Psalms 19, verses 1 and 2. Just back a couple pages. Pastor Peter, would you read those for me, please? Psalms 19, verses 1 and 2. Okay, so the heavens do what? They declare his glory. So what does it mean to glorify God? So we throw these words out sometimes, but what does it mean to glorify God? What's, what does he mean here? What does it mean to glorify? What other words? Sorry? Sorry? Greatly acknowledge, absolutely. Yes, sorry, Peter? Yeah, no, acknowledge. What other words would you use? Yeah, uplift or lift up. Declare it, absolutely, to declare it openly, right? The previous verse we saw here, what word is used here? Is the word what? Is to revere, is to worth, is to worship, is to ascribe the worth, is to say, God, you are incredible. Wow, look what you're doing in all that you're in, 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 in all that you've created. And that's what we're doing in that God chart, right? As we're kind of reflecting on who he is, we're actually glorifying him. We're lifting him up and, and revealing who he is. So the next question is, how does creation reveal God's glory, God's greatness? How does creation reveal God's glory, his greatness? That's what it says here. It says that the heavens declare the glory of God. How in the world does, does the heavens do that? Yeah, right? When you, go out on a, when you go out on a starlit night and you lie back in the grass and you look at the expanse, what, what, it, what comes to mind? Wow, right? Boy, that all just happened, right? Good thing that just all kind of exploded into place. Is that what we do? No, we say, wow, like what holds all of that there? God, you're incredible. And our hearts are lifted up in worship, aren't they? Looking at his creation, we see the intricacy of a, of a flower or an insect, and we just look at, at the design of God, and we glorify him, right? Especially us, we love insects and snakes, right? See, God created all things to display his purposefulness so that all of creation would glorify him. So think of this for a second here. Every plant has incredible symmetry. Have you ever looked at a flower and noticed how all of the petals are all the way around perfectly? That's God, right? That's God revealing his purposefulness, the color and the shape and the structure and the uniqueness of each one. Stand back in amazement. Let's stop to smell the roses, right? because that reflects God. Each plant photosynthesizes to create oxygen to support life. How in the world does that happen? A God who is purposeful, right? He knew that we needed it. Each plant adapts and moves towards the light and, and hibernates in the winter. Like, how does it figure that out? A God of purposefulness, right? Now, notice this one. Each plant is so complex that a scientist can study one species for his entire career and never fully understand it. Uh, I see insects that are so small, you can't see that it would have a heart or something like that. You don't know how it crawls. Yes. You don't know how it has life. Yes. But again, the God of purposefulness, right? Sometimes I can't think of why this insect is there. I can't think of any purpose for it being there. But God does, right? He's exact in all that he does. This uh, lesson is really hard on me because my, uh, my mind, my creative mind just goes all over the world. And I would love to be able to spend days with you showing you the vastness of what God has created. The vastness. And not just empty vastness. We are talking detailed vastness. This picture that we got, where's my picture? This picture that we got is a picture from the Hubble telescope. Everybody heard of the Hubble telescope? This is one giant massive telescope and it is shot out into the sea, into the um, sea. <laughs> into the or, 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 orbit. Yeah, you said, you said, you said sea, so I mean, yes, anyway. I know I was supposed to do that. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a small picture of what it, uh, of, of what it has taken. And, and inside of this picture, if, if you can see this, this is like 
the Milky Way, that is similar to the Milky Way. This picture has the Milky Way in it. We can't see it, but it's in there. And it's a galaxy. So all of these pieces, these, these pieces, these lights here that you see are in fact like Milky Way. There's not a star, but there's billions of stars mm -hmm. in each of these little lights. And in here, you see this picture, you see about 10,000 galaxies, 10,000. There are over 100,000 galaxies that our people, mankind, our scientists, have so far calculated. And they have not come to the end of themselves yet. They have not seen the end of the atmosphere yet. And there's more to come. Incredible? Incredible. And God spoke, and there it is. How do you not see the glory of God? How do you not see the magnificent beauty of what God has done? It, it's just automatic to give him glory. There is a scripture that talks about when we see all of this, and we have not heard about God, but this is supposed to be. Mm. Sharing, I was, um, I had a job and an employee, uh, and a fellow employee said to me, prove to me there's a God, and, but don't tell me, don't talk to me about creation. Oh. I mean, I, I don't need to talk about creation, but that is the biggest picture and the biggest proof that there's a God that exists. It's incredible. And it's through these contrasts that we do that we want to share with you, and I know we have, David has already shared with you, it's, it's very limited to be doing it, but we want to help you wrap your head around the fact that our God is so big and so glorious, as we see that he is eternal without beginning or end, all-powerful and self-existent, supreme spirit, everywhere present at all times, one yet trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, all-knowing, Absolutely holy and always acts perfectly. Even in what he creates, he creates perfectly. And he judges perfectly. And he's absolute owner and perfect ruler over all that he has created. All to do what, ladies and gentlemen? To give him glory. 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 That we might see his glory. Now, as God has declared in Isaiah 42, verse 8, that he will not give his glory to another. He will not give his position to another. And so this, this position that he has, as, as he's unique in that way. He alone can be glorified. He alone is creator. He alone is all-powerful. He alone is absolutely purposeful in all that he does. Now, I want to share something here with you that I think is really profound. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, at day 1, it begins with, And God said, Let there be light. Now, on the second day, it begins in the same way, And God said, Let there be an expanse, in verse, in verse 6. And take a moment at some point afterwards and just mark this, because it's very profound. On day 3, it begins with, And God said, Let the waters be gathered. And then on, on day 4, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse. And then on day five, and God said, let the waters team with living creatures. And then on day six, it begins, and God said, let the land produce living vegetation. But, you, but, but if you look at day, day number three in verse nine, and actually go to your Bibles in Genesis chapter one, don't take my words for it. Notice this, how God will not give his glory to another. Verse nine, we have the beginning of day number three. And God said, let, and God said, let the water under the sky be gathered, right? Now, if you go down to verse 11, still on day number three, and God said, let the land produce vegetation. So here is the principle here. Plants did not come to be by themselves out of lifeless dirt without God directing and creating. Isn't that profound? If God did not say, and God said, let that appear, we would never have plants because lifeless dirt cannot create life unless God creates it. What does that do to the theory of evolution? 
What does that do to the theory of evolution? Kind of destroys it, doesn't it? See, this is the power of who God is. And incidentally, on day number six, God repeats this again. And God said, let the land produce living, uh, uh, living creatures and, and let us. And, God's, and God said, let man be created in our image. So without, you, don't get man to an, you don't get animals to man without and God said. It's impossible for it just to evolve naturally. God's built this into his word. Okay, so here's the characteristic. Another characteristic, God is orderly, faithful, and purposeful in all that he does. How about us? Are we orderly and purposeful in all that we do? All you got to do is look at my mess and you see how, uh, how, uh, how, how messy I am. How about the spirits? Are the angels, are they like God? No, so not like God. He alone is orderly, faithful, and purposeful. Who is greater? God is greater, isn't he? Uh, in this brief short time that we've had together this evening so far, to me it seems brief, but to you it might seem like a, an hour and a half already. But uh, God has revealed himself through creation as being a God who is orderly, a God who is faithful, and a God who is purposeful. Purposeful in what way? In many ways. Definitely in many ways, and for many reasons. But to what? To give him and to point to him and glorify him. We got a picture here that we want to show you that we're going to represent and we're going to use to represent God as a creator. In this picture, every time we talk about God as who created the world or God as creator, we would probably use we would use this picture. In this picture, I want you to think about these things about who God is. God is eternal, all-powerful, supreme spirit, everywhere present. One yet trinity, all-knowing, absolutely holy, absolute owner, and orderly, faithful, and purposeful in all that he does. Do you see anything else, any other character of God that would be, de be depicted by this picture at all? Any other character that you could see? Well, I see him as all-powerful. All How did it all come to be, right? Like we've kind of I, we've kind of highlighted he's ordering faithful, but he's also all powerful to create all of that, right? Anything else? I'm thinking. I'm thinking. <laughs> How do we see God as all knowing in creation? God knows what he's doing. Like look at the in, look at look at the intricacy here, right? How in the world did all of that fit together? How did he put it all the design inside of there, right? Sorry? Okay. Yeah, no. What other of these characteristics do you see in creation? We've just kind of highlighted this one here, but what other characteristics do you see? Any other characteristics? Oh, his care. Yeah, his care. I mean, uh, when you look at uh, what was in the sea, had to eat to survive. Mm -hmm. What's in the air, had to eat to survive. And he provided the sustenance for it. Absolutely. Somebody else is going to say something. Chad, I think you were saying something. Uh, yeah. Again, that reflects his goodness, doesn't it? That reflects his holiness and his perfection, right? Just magnifies who he is, right? How about his ownership? Do we see his ownership in this? It's his creation. It's his creation. It belongs to him, right? He can do with it as he pleases. Okay, so let's take a moment this evening, and Kevin's got his paper handy there again. So what beliefs clash with God being a God who is orderly, faithful, and purposeful? Evolution, evolution right? How does evolution, how does evolution clash with a God who is orderly, faithful, and purposeful? Yeah, right? We need something to begin it. And evolution says what? Bang, Bang it happened, it just came up, came up by itself. It, we have a problem with evolution, don't we? Yeah, yes, thank you. Thank you. Well, how, else does our, how else does our culture clash with a God of order, a God of order, faithfulness, and purpose? How does our culture clash with that? How does it struggle with that? How, is it, how does it... Right, yeah. 
Well, again, because they're defying, because really they're defying this orderliness that God instilled into creation, right? That's at the heart of it. So the heart of that issue is God. They have a wrong, they have a wrong view of God, don't they? God's not perfect. What other, what other ways does our culture clash or struggle with this characteristic of God, orderly, faithful, and purposeful? Yeah. yeah, each person is their own God, right? I can do what I want, right? How else? Atheism, how so? Yeah. Yes, that struggle. Atheism says there is no God. Well, how in the, what do you do with all of this design? How do you do with all of this creation, right? So again, at the heart of it, the heart of evolution is actually fighting against who God is, in one level, his order, list, and faithfulness. How about those who say, I can't know if there's a God? Agnostics, I can't know. Does that clash with this God of order and faithfulness and purpose? They must have blinders on, to, right? Just not to not see it. How about, how, about the belief, how about the belief out there that this world has always been wicked? This world has always been evil. It's always the survival of the fittest. Does that fit with um, this truth that we're learning about God and his order and his faithfulness? No, right? Do you have another one, Dwayne? No, okay. Okay, so let's think, let's think of evolution here, how evolution discounts God. So evolution teaches that there is no order in creation. It, it just kind of happened without purpose or design. Do you see what they're doing to the very character of God? Without a, without a wrong belief of God, look what the result is here, right? Evolution teaches that there was brokenness as a part of the design, trial and error and death and survival of the fittest, right? What is it, what is it seeking to destroy? God, right? It's a wrong view of God. Evolution gives no explanation for the complexity and order of creation. Evolution has no first or purposeful cause that started everything. And evolution glorifies what? The creation, not its creator. And so do we see how at the, at the heart of all of this, it clashes with God's very nature and his very character. And this is the problem with evolution because it discounts God and his word, right? It discounts who God is in every level of his majesty and his glory. Evolution doesn't work because it doesn't fit with the purpose of God. See, God is a, God is a God of order, faithfulness, and purposefulness, created animals to only, rep only reproduce after their own kinds. See, dogs, can, they can, they can um, reproduce with wolves or with coyotes, but not a cat, right? And Kevin already kind of talked about that. There can be changes within a kind of animal, but never a change across different kinds of animals. An animal cannot create a right new DNA within itself. See, that's what, at the heart of evolution, what they're wanting, what, they're, what, what the problem is, is it goes right against the very character of God that he instilled in creation. To this day, scientists are still looking for the missing link of evolution, and they haven't observed evolution taking place. They can't reproduce it in a lab, and they can't test it. And so evolution is simply what? It's just a theory, and that's all it is. And why do they have that theory? Because they don't want to believe in God, and they can't prove it. It's just a theory. And they see that there is a creator behind this watch. They see that there is a designer behind this watch and a maker. Yet, when looking at the world, they cannot see. What is that? They cannot see the creator. What is that? Blinded. They are blinded. In God's eye, that's just foolishness. How much more so is their creation design, uh, a very specific design revealed in a plant, in a tree, in the seasons, in our orbit, in our world? How much more so is there proof of a creator, designer, 
Far beyond that watch. Far beyond that watch. That, that watch was mass produced and yet everything God produces is unique. Mm. Like there's no two snowflakes the same. There's no two trees identical. Everything is physically unique. Mm. Yes, definitely. I love, this, I love this cartoon. God, if you're real, show me a sign. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm waiting. Like how, like, isn't that the foolishness of, of man? Discounting God? For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what He has made, so that they are without... Fault.